All right, so we're going to now go into Ezekiel 33, and uh, we're going to look at something here this morning. Ezekiel chapter 33, and uh, we're going to read verses 1 through 6. We know Ezekiel uh, was a, a, one of the major prophets of God, and, and, uh, uh, and we know that Ezekiel was a man who was burdened uh, for his people. And uh, we also know that the Lord had showed him uh, great things, many things about, uh, about Israel as a nation. And I remember that uh, in the beginning uh, part of, the, uh, of this book, I uh, remember Ezekiel sat astonished, as the Bible says, for seven days. Uh, that the Lord really showed him some things about his people and about what he wanted him to do. Uh, and, and we also see that, uh, the, that the heart of Ezekiel uh, was, was hurt and it was burdened by what, what he saw. Uh, we also know that Ezekiel did some weird things too, right? Uh, some things that I don't know if I would ever do, but nonetheless, uh, he was a prophet of God, a man who loved his people, a man who loved God, uh, a man who wanted to uh, see his people get right with God. Amen. And uh, that should be our desire to see people get right with God. Uh, but as we're going to look at this morning, uh, I believe that there are some things uh, even for us today uh, that we can take away from this. And and uh, we see what I'm going to preach to you this morning ever more increasing uh, in our our walk with the Lord and and, and our culture, our society today. Uh, we see this ever more increasing. And so let's read verses one through six, verses one through six of Ezekiel 33. It says, again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, son of man, speak to the children of thy people and say unto them, when I bring the sword upon a land, if the people of the land take a man of their coast and set him for their watchman, if when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning, his blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchmen see the sword come and blow not the trumpet and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. Let's pray. Father, we uh, Lord, we love you so much. Lord, we're so, so blessed, uh, so thankful, Lord, to uh, to have the word of God, to uh, Lord, to to be able to commune with you through your word. And uh, Lord, we're, we're thankful as as a people, Lord, of how you have brought us out of things and how you have uh, met our needs and and how you love us and, and how you're merciful and gracious toward us. Uh, Lord, at this time uh, now, as we draw our attention to your word, uh, Lord, help us, Father, give us a heart to receive your word. Give us a mind, uh, spiritual ears to hear. Uh, Lord, give us a heart to receive. May the word fall on good ground today, Lord. Uh, we pray that as a result of sitting under the preaching of your word, that we'll leave different than what we came in, Lord, having spent time with you. Uh, Lord, we want to say thank you in advance for what you will do uh, in this message. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So a missionary uh, challenged me some time ago uh, from this passage as he preached a, tr a tremendous message on the believer's responsibility to sound the trumpet. And you understand that we all, as God's people, have a responsibility to sound the trumpet. Amen. Uh, we have a responsibility to go out and uh, uh, to make people aware, to let them know uh, of a God who uh, not only wants to save them, but we know a, a God who is also just and who is also going to uh, bring judgment upon all wickedness and sin. Amen. And so we have a responsibility to sound the trumpet as believers. Uh, and as he preached down through this passage, my attention was drawn to verse number six and uh, if you will uh, oblige me there, let's read verse number six again. It says, but if the watchmen see the sword come and blow not the trumpet and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from uh, any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. Now, that's something to think about just for a moment. 
Because we know that if you go over to 1 Corinthians, we know that there is going to be a day where the, the believer is going to stand before where? Before the judgment seat of Christ, right? And we know that there's going to be, during that time, uh, I believe that there is going to be still weeping. I believe that, that, that uh, rewards are going to be lost, amen? Uh, we're going to be judged as Christians for the things that we did in this life, amen? Uh, that, that we redeemed the time, as the Bible says, uh, that we made much uh, use of our time in, in letting the people know about, about the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Uh, that's how we should be spending our time. And so we know that there's going to be uh, that day that's going to come. But as I read through this passage, this verse, uh, I believe the Lord impressed upon my heart some sobering questions. And these sobering questions I want to present to you this morning. Number one, why aren't some believers sounding the trumpet? Yeah, that's right. And then number two, when the trumpet is sounded, why is it not a clear sound? Amen. Why is it not a clear sound? Uh, so so uh, uh, if I had to put a title on this message this morning, uh, I would say tolerance, testimony and trumpet. OK, tolerance, testimony and trumpet. Now, I want to draw your attention to a character in the Bible that we know very well uh, named Lot, because I believe the answers to these questions will be found as we take a brief look at his life. Now, we know some things about Lot and, and Abram. We know uh, we've read these stories before, and so I feel like I don't have to labor a whole lot on that. But we know the story of Lot and his uncle Abraham in Genesis chapter 13 of how both families left Egypt and began to journey into the south. And into the south. Now, we also know that the Bible makes it clear that strife had begun to break out between uh, really the herdsmen and between the two because of all the substance they had. So we also know that uh, so Abraham suggested uh, for he and Lot to separate. And that is found in verse number nine of Genesis 13. And after that, the Bible says some very serious things. Go over to Genesis chapter 13. And uh, we're going to go back to, well, actually, we're going to kind of jump around here uh, in the Bible. We're not going to be uh, in one particular place parked for, for any length of time. We're going to look around a little bit. Uh, but it says there, uh, Genesis chapter 13. Now, uh, in, in verse number nine, we know that the Bible uh, says here that Abraham says, Is not the whole land before thee? He says, separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou will take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. So we know that as a result of the strife and the contention that had broke out, Abraham had decided for, for, the, for the two to separate. And we know that after that, the Bible says in verse number 10 uh, that Lot lifted up his eyes. You see that in verse number 10? It says, and Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah even as the garden of the Lord like the land of Egypt as thou comest unto Zoar. Wow so we see something here before this place Sodom and Gomorrah was turned into what it was turned into it was a well watered place. It was very plush it was nice Right. It was like the Garden of Eden, uh, as the Bible says. And it was a place surely that Lot thought that he and his family uh, would enjoy themselves and it would be a nice place for them. Uh, and then we notice down in verse number 12, though, it says uh, uh, in verse number 12, and Abraham dwelled in the land of Canaan and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain. And what did he do after that? He pitched his tent toward Sodom. Amen. He pitched his tent towards Sodom. Let me just say right off here at the, at the onset of this message that there is something that, that we have to be very careful of. Uh, I realize that I'm on, I'm on, uh, uh, on the YouTube there, uh, but I like to walk around a little bit. Amen? And uh, so the people in YouTube land are going to see blank space up here, but they're going to hear a voice. And so I just, all I can say to them is just listen up. Amen? <laughs> just listen up. But what I want you to get a hold of right off at the bat here is that uh, something we need to be careful about is looking out into a certain place 
and seeing and thinking that this is going to be the right place for us. Uh, you know, we, we know the, the things such as the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. We have to be careful that we are not guided by those three things, but we are guided by the will of God. Amen. And we see that that Lot saw this place as something to be well watered. Uh, it was a it was plush. It was a place that surely him and his family would enjoy. But we know that one day that 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 place was going to be destroyed by God. Yeah. You got to be careful about that. Sometimes we get into this. Wow, this surely looks nice. Or this is what we say that the grass is greener on the other side. Right. Uh, that where I'm at now is really not a good place for me. And so I'd rather be here because this looks nice. And and you think you're going to get a blessing over here in this place. But really, God didn't tell you to go to that place at all. And then you wind up having to leave that place as well. Amen. Because he's going to destroy that place one time. Right. right? It's not a good idea to be guided by your emotions and by your flesh, right? We know that. I'm, I'm not talking to anybody here that doesn't know that. We understand that. But it's good to be reminded of that. Amen? Amen. Don't be guided by your emotions and your flesh. Just because it looks nice, brother, doesn't mean that it is nice. Amen? Amen? Doesn't mean that it is nice. So we see that Lot lifted up his eyes and he pitched his tent towards Sodom, only to eventually find himself in Sodom, and let me say this, away from God. Away from God, okay? That is very huge because what we take away from that is when Lot had lifted up his eyes and began to pitch his tent towards Sodom, brother, you realize that it wasn't all in one lump sum that he found himself in Sodom, right? Uh, we can consider that to be a backsliding, right? Uh, that there was some backsliding that was taking place. And eventually he found himself in Sodom away from God. You know, the worst thing that we can do is leave the voice of God, right? The worst thing that we can do is leave the will of God and, and find ourselves on our own in a place that we shouldn't even be in the first place, right? And so he wound up leaving uh, the voice of God and found himself in this place. And this was a place where he was dwelling amidst, uh, among, amidst uh, men who were wicked and sinners, as the Bible says. So let's answer this first question. Why aren't some believers sounding the trumpet? Number one, tolerance. Yep. Tolerance. OK. That's not an unusual word to us. No. We know the word tolerance. Amen. Now. Webster's Dictionary defines tolerance as a willingness to accept feelings, habits, or beliefs that are different from your own, right? Now, this is a daily challenge for the Christian, amen? Uh, this is something that, that we are, are faced with on a daily basis as we are surrounded by uh, opinionated TV shows uh, and we're surrounded by social media. Oh my word, I could probably preach on Facebook all day long about all of the, the, the chaos and all of the, uh, all of the opinions that come out of this page and uh, uh, I, I you know, I, I just say this, that if we took a break from Facebook for about a week, our health would be better. Our blood pressure would be down a little bit. Amen. Uh, because, uh, hey, if you haven't started, if you don't have a Facebook account, praise the Lord. Don't get one. Amen. Don't get one. Uh, uh, Facebook, I'm not completely shutting it down because it can be used for a good evangelistic tool. Uh, but m off, more often than not, it's a place where you hear all sorts of things. And there's just so much strife and contention. And we've got to be careful about that. And I think about these opinionated TV shows. And uh, the one show that really sticks in my craw is the show called The View. That really sticks in my craw. Now, uh, I'm, I'm one that when I'm looking at stuff like that, we know, uh, and I might have mentioned this to you before, but uh, we know the, the, one of the main mouthpieces on that show, besides Miss Goldberg, is uh, a lady by the name of Joy Behar. Right. And now this lady, who is, I believe, a Jew, isn't she? She's Jewish descent, isn't she? I don't know, Behar, I don't know. I'm just, you know, I'm stereotyping or something. I don't know, Behar, I don't know. But anyways, uh, you think of this this... 
uh, this lady, Joy Behar, who has made mention of our vice president, Mike Pence, uh, that he is some kind of a crazy man uh, who talks to the Lord. Right. Uh, who is this that talks to the Lord and the Lord talks back? <laughs> right. Uh, she's she's making fun of this guy. Uh, but, hey, he's got a relationship with the Lord, Amen. does he not? That's a relationship with the Lord. But the point is, is that her opinions, that she's uh, her viewpoint, if you will, that she is uh, uh, saying on that show. You realize that millions of people all around the world are watching this show. And you know what they're doing while they're watching it? They're going, mm -hmm, you know, she's right. You know, she's got a point there. Amen. And that is that, you know, the devil uses that kind of stuff all day long. Amen. He uses that kind of stuff all day long. Now, I would say this, that everyone is entitled to their own opinion. But when it is contrary to biblical truth and standard, that's where we should draw the line. Amen. That's where we should draw the line. You realize that truth is something that is true regardless of what we believe. An opinion is a belief or conclusion held with confidence, but not substantiated by positive knowledge or proof. You realize that all of the opinions that come from people are not substantiated by the word of God, but are just that, just opinions, just what they might think, right? And that's the kind of society that we live in. You realize that you and I as believers must be, hey, we must be advocators for truth because truth has the power to change opinions. Right. Amen. It has the power to change opinions. You realize that the world teaches and proclaims tolerance. Yeah. It is their cry. And they think it's what it lacks. You know, they especially accuse the church of not practicing tolerance. You know, they misapply the famous verse in Matthew 7, 1, uh, where it says, judge not that ye be not judged. When really this verse admonishes us to be careful of how we judge others, because with what judgment we judge, we will be judged the same. Right. Amen? Amen. And we got to be careful about that. Right. You know, the Bible says in John 7, 24, that we are to judge righteous judgment. Amen. It says, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. The only way that you're going to judge righteous judgment is by how? Is by being in the word of God. Amen. Being in the word of God. So we're to judge righteous judgment. Uh, there are many Christians, and I want you to hear this. There are many Christians in today's society who have become tolerant to the sin and wickedness around them. And instead of reproving the works of darkness, they are approving them. OK. And that is a sad state of affairs that our church is in today, that Christians today are approving of the sin and not reproving it. And maybe that might be you today. Maybe you might be OK with the sin that is going on. Listen, hey, even in your own house, maybe you might be OK with that. Maybe you might be OK with the sin and wickedness that is going on around you in the world today. And we can just click on the TV and we can see all kinds of sin and wickedness going on all around us. Amen. Yeah. I don't know about you, but the Holy Spirit of God in me and in you is weeping over what's going on in our society today. Amen. That there is a, a weeping and, and, and maybe you've done that. Maybe you've seen what's going on in our world today and just would we'll just take a seat for a moment and, and just allow the Holy Spirit to, to just grip your heart like he did Ezekiel. And he saw all of that stuff going on and he just began to, to weep over his people. Listen, it's not only the unsaved, but it's the saved yeah. that we should be weeping over, too. Amen. You know, there might be some in this church in Freedom's Way who are no longer here anymore because they've did a lot and gone back out there into the world. Right. Living in sin now. Yeah. Right. You know, instead of 
reproving the works of darkness, they approve them. You know, Ephesians 5, 11, you don't have to turn there. Uh, it says, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Amen. Yeah. That we're to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, right. but rather we are to reprove them. Amen? Amen. So you say, well, how do I reprove these works of darkness that is going on? How is that done? You realize that we uh, reprove them by the word of God. We reprove them. Listen, you reprove the works of darkness by your lifestyle. Amen. Yep. Mm. Let's talk about that for a minute. Let's park there for a minute. What about your lifestyle? How is your lifestyle today? What is that like? Because, Brother Les, we are to reprove the works of darkness by our lifestyle. Amen? What is your lifestyle like today? Is it lending to the sin and wickedness that's going on in the world? Or do you choose to not walk that way, but walk against the grain? Showing that you have a lifestyle that is godly. Amen? A godly lifestyle. Not only do we reprove them by the word of God and by your lifestyle, uh, by your conversation. Listen, your life should be a standing rebuke of a sinful world, and you should be ready to express your disapproval of its wickedness in every form, right? Uh, I share this story sometimes, and uh, boy, whenever I think about it, I, I, uh, mm. I might have shared this here before, but I don't know if I've gone into a little, uh, to great detail. Uh, I was, some of you know my testimony, I was uh, a prescription drug addict for, for many, many years. Uh, I lived in Arizona for a long time. I, I, I grew up in Arizona. As a young man in high school, you know, I was uh, not living right, not doing right. Uh, uh, I had uh, did some bad things and uh, wound up not being able to stay at my home anymore. And, and uh, so, so my mom, she, you know, she said, well, why don't you go stay with your dad? So I went to go stay with my dad in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And, and uh, uh, my dad and my stepmom, they've been Christians ever since I, I was a little kid. And, and so uh, I remember uh, going to Albuquerque and I remember, uh, and let me tell you this, let me say this, that a geographical change does not make any difference. No. Amen. Uh, your heart needs to be changed. Amen. And so, so, so if you're like that today, if you think that a geographical change is going to somehow help you with whatever you're dealing with, it's not. Amen. It's got to be a new heart. It's got to be a changed heart. Amen. Uh, so I wound up there in Albuquerque smoking cigarettes, drinking, partying half the night and uh, coming home to a Christian family. You can imagine how that was. It was like oil and water, right? Now, at the time, at the time, my brothers, uh, my half brothers were, were very young, uh, two and four. And uh, they saw their big brother coming in the house at all hours of the night, smelling like booze and tobacco and all sorts of things. Uh, one day, my stepmom got fed up with it and told my dad that she didn't want me there anymore. And so my dad said, I'm going to drop you off at the truck stop and you're going to have to find your own way back to Phoenix, Arizona. Wow. Yeah. So here, yes, tough love, right? Hey, listen. Uh, by no means am I still uh, uh, angry at that because at one point I was a little bitter about that, right? Uh, but but uh, uh, I'm so thankful that that happened, right? I'm thankful that that happened. So here I am in Albuquerque uh, at the truck stop uh, for two days. Uh, all I had was a pair of white denim jeans on and a green shirt, collared shirt. That's all I had. Now, sleeping on the bus, a broken down abandoned bus, uh, my pants 
were no longer white, <laughs> but they were dingy. So here I am, uh, I, I'm certified now, right? I'm, I'm, I'm out there living on the streets. I went to knock at a church door and ask them for money for help to get back to Phoenix, and they said, we can't help you. So finally, day number two, I got on the phone and I said, hey, mom, I need to get back to Arizona. And so she called my dad and did whatever she did there, probably yelled at him and all that kind of stuff. And, I, and finally, I got a phone call or uh, uh, I called my dad and he said, go to the to the airlines and uh, get get the plane. We'll meet you and get you a ticket. And so I finally got to the uh, to to uh, the airlines and and uh, I didn't have any money to pay the taxi guy. So the taxi cab driver, he kept all of my clothes. So all I had was those white jeans still and that green collared shirt. And finally, I got home and 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 life passed and and all of these things. Twenty years later, 20, about 21 years later, I get in touch with my dad. I finally locate him again, and we get back together, and guess who's living in the house doing drugs, drinking, partying all night long? My two half-brothers. That's what they're doing now in the home. That's what they're doing now. And so, so why do I say all of that? Because... The, the, the point is, is that there can be a time where at one point you were disapproving of the sin and wickedness going on. But then all of a sudden you began to digress in that. Right. You begin to tolerate it. Don't let that be you. You know, in a message titled The Sin of Tolerance that the late Billy Graham preached back in 1950, back when he was preaching the true gospel, amen? He said this, and I quote, tolerance in one sense implies the compromise of one's convictions, a yielding of ground upon important issues. Hence, over tolerance in moral issues has made us soft, flabby, and devoid of conviction. We have become tolerant about divorce, we have become tolerant about the use of alcohol. We have become tolerant about delinquency. We have become tolerant about wickedness in high places. We have become tolerant about immorality. We have become tolerant about crime. And we have become tolerant about godlessness. Right. We have become tolerant about unbelief. That's right. End quote. How about you? How about you today? You know, it seems to me that what was inappropriate last year is now appropriate this year. Right. Amen. That what was inappropriate to you maybe last year, that because of the advertising that's taking place and the, the commercials and the ads and the social media, now all of a sudden those things have seeped into your mind, down into your heart, and now you become anesthetized to it. And now you say, well, that's OK. Everybody else is doing it. You know, I could probably talk to some of the older saints in here and they would probably say these uh, these these uh, uh, these little tight form fitting pants that the ladies wear. Is it yoga pants, honey? What is is that what it is? Yoga pants? I, I don't see them doing no yoga or nothing. <laughs> they ain't doing no kind of yoga. Right. But listen, if you think about it, back in the 50s and the 60s, they would look at something like that and go, whew. Modesty is out the window, right? Modesty is out the window. It's gone almost, right? Uh, I'm curious to see how it's going to be next year, right? Whether we wear cellophane or something. You get my point. The point is, is that what was was uh, uh, what was uh, 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 inappropriate last year is now appropriate this year. Listen, Christians in today's society have become irresponsible, apathetic, unfaithful to God and indifferent to the things around them. They just simply say, I just don't even care anymore. I don't even care anymore. You ever been apathetic? You ever been apathetic? 
where you just you don't even have any feelings toward it, right? You're just not even concerned about it anymore, right? You say, well, it's just one person. What am I going to do about the situation? How am I going to, uh, to help in it? Might as well just, just let, it, let it be. Amen. You realize that you can do a lot in your prayers. Amen? Amen. Advocating truth. Amen? Irresponsible, apathetic, unfaithful to God, indifferent to the things around them. So I say that to say this. Tolerance obscures the view of the watchman. Yeah, that's right. You understand? Yes. Tolerance obscures the view of the watchman. You realize that going back to our story with Lot, you realize that Lot was a just man, as the Bible calls him. Lot was a just man who knew God, uh, listen, that also was a judge in Sodom. Go to Genesis chapter 19. That's right. Genesis chapter 19. We know that Lot was a, uh, a judge in Sodom. Yes. Uh, the Bible says that he sat in the gate. Uh, when someone sits in the gate, uh, that means that they are a, if I can say it, a shot caller. Yeah. That they have uh, uh, a responsibility, uh, Sister Smaltz, to, uh, to, to be an advocator of what is right. That's Amen? Right. They can potentially change the laws in the place. Uh, they can potentially, listen, uh, if I'm sitting in the gate of something, then I want things to, to, to be right. I want to uh, implement things that are going to be godly, that things that are going to please God. Amen? That's right. To do right. Now, Genesis chapter 19, verse number 9, we know the story. The angels have come. They're getting ready to pass judgment upon this place. Amen? And uh, Lot doesn't know that yet. All he knows is that these two men have come and uh, that he's going to take them in. And he, uh, just as a, a good Jew would do, would take them in and, and begin to try to, to minister to them and try to, try to uh, show hospitality to them. And so he brings them in, and, and here we are now uh, at the height of lust. Amen? Uh, these men of Sodom are burning in their lust one for another, and here they are beating down the door. They want to know these guys. And what I mean by know is not, oh, hey, how you doing? What's your name? Where are you from? What's your birthday? No, they want to know these guys in a very nasty, wicked way. So he says in verse number 9, and they said, stand back. Just imagine. Just imagine the emotions right now. Listen, can I say that lust, the lust of the flesh doesn't care That's right. about anything. It doesn't care. It just wants what it wants. And they said, stand back. And they said again, this one fellow came into sojourn. Now, who's the one fellow? It's Lot. He came into sojourn. And it says, and he will needs be a what? A judge. Now, will we deal worse with thee than with them? And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. Wow. Could you just imagine that scene? Could you imagine Lot over here? The, the angels are behind the door. Can you imagine Lot comes out and he's holding the door and they're like, let us, they're trying to get past this guy. Can you imagine that? Yeah. They're trying to get past him. The, the, the lust of the flesh, hey, it wanted in. And he said, no, no. Just imagine that. The lust of the flesh. It was at its height. He said, this man, he needs to be a judge. You realize that being a judge, Lot had a great responsibility, opportunity, and duty to honor God and his family in sounding the trumpet against the sin and wickedness in the city, but instead allowed it to go on and if you recall, in his poor judgment, he even gave his two daughters yeah. over to the men yeah. 
to be raped. Isn't that something? Now, these men were Sodom, Sodomites. We know that they didn't want anything to do with women. But you realize that in their lust, in their lust, these men wanted to have their way. He offered up his two daughters to the men to be raped in the process. Let me say something about the world. You know, the world's mindset is that God is a tolerating God. Yeah. The world says he loves us yeah. and allows us to continue on as we are. Yeah. Listen, if you think that you're going to get away with the sin and the wickedness that you are causing, you say, oh, I got away with it today. I just rolled my dice, Brother Bob, and I'm lucky today. Uh, I came up good today as a result of my wicked, sinful lifestyle. You got another thing coming. God is not excusing what you're doing. God is not okay with it, with what you're doing. Yeah. Let me submit to you this morning that while he is yet forbearing the sin and wickedness in the world, there is coming a day that he will address it. One day he will judge the sin and wickedness in the world. Hey, because he is holy, he is righteous, and he is a just God. And he's not going to allow it to go on. Amen. Romans chapter 2, verse number 4. Go there. Everybody okay? Oh, yeah. Romans chapter 2, verse number 4. It says in verse number 4, it says... And now this is the Apostle Paul making the case here, uh, teaching on justification, uh, uh, wonderful doctrines in our, our, our Bible. It says in verse number four, or despiseth, despiseth thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering. Let me stop there for a minute. Do you despise the goodness of God? You shouldn't. No. Amen. You shouldn't. But you realize that our behavior sometimes does. Even though we don't say, I despise your goodness and your, and your greatness. Our behavior sometimes does. It says, and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up to unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. You realize that there are sinners and wickedness going on in our world today, and they are getting hard, more hard hearted over the goodness of God over the forbearance of God, over the long suffering of God, and yet and still, like Pharaoh, their heart, their heart gets harder and harder and harder. That's right. Stiff necked. That's right. Prideful. Yep. When really what that is is the forbearance of God. Yes. It's the goodness of God. Amen? Amen. Aren't you glad? That when you were out in your sin, are you saved? Aren't you glad? What's your first name? Beth. Aren't you glad, Sister Beth, that when you were out there in your sin and in your mess, in your wickedness, that God showed his forbearance toward you. He didn't let you die in your mess, in your sin. But then he got a hold of your heart by way of the preaching of the word of God and by the Holy Spirit of God, yes. that coupled with the two, your grace met faith and you got saved. Aren't you glad about that? Amen. Amen. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad about that, that that happened? There are some people today who didn't have that shot. They didn't get that. They died in their sin. 
Everybody has an opportunity. Amen? Amen. Everybody has an opportunity. So the question begs to be asked, what time we got to be done? done? That's not the question. The question didn't beg to be asked that. What time are we done? <laughs> but the question begs to be asked, why was Lot so tolerant of the sin and wickedness around him? Yeah. Go to 2 Peter chapter 2, please. 2 Peter chapter 2. And let's look at verse number 7. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse number 7. Familiar passages to us. He says in verse number seven and delivered just lot. Now, that's interesting because you can take that two ways, can't you? Yes. That he delivered just lot, that lot was really the only one that got out of there. But we know that this is talking about just like justified in Christ. Amen. That he delivered just lot vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing, underline that, and hearing, underline that, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. You realize that what was going on with Lot was that he was surrounded. He was saturated amongst the sin and the wickedness around him. Amen? Amen. That, that he was amidst a people, Brother Smaltz, who were full of sin and wickedness. Hey, not wanting to get right with God, but wanting to do that which was evil in their heart continually. Yeah. This is what he was around all the time. Can I say that a life that is destitute of the word of God will make bad decisions? Yeah. Amen? That a life destitute of the knowledge of God, it produces tolerance. Yes. You know, Lot failed to spend precious time with the Lord. That's right. Let me say that it is vital that you and I, as believers, wash in the word of God daily. Moment by moment, hour by hour, minute by minute, second by second. It is all so important that you get a daily bath in the word of God. Amen. Because we're in places out in the world. Sister G, because I don't know how to pronounce the last name. Every time I say it, I get corrected by Pastor Cook. Garland all, I don't know. Brother man. You realize that you're out there in the world every day, yeah. right? Right? That you're out there uh, uh, in, the wor in the workplace, brother. Yeah. That, that you're out there uh, 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 paying bills. You're out there doing all sorts of things and you realize that you need to take a bath daily in the word of God. Amen. Uh, what happens if I keep going to the barbershop long enough? <laughs> Mm -hmm. I'm going to get up. Right. I was the guy. Listen, I was the guy that was sitting at the barber shop <sighs> for a while. Rapping with the guys. Oh, no, I don't need no haircut. I'm good. As you can see, I'm good. I don't need no cut. But then next thing you know, day after day. Ah, might as well go ahead and get a haircut. Amen. What am I saying? Bad communication corrupts good character. That's right. You go to the barbershop. I'm using old, old euphemisms or whatever. You know, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 7, 1, it says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Amen. You know, we got to perfect holiness. How do you how do you become perfect at something? You practice it, right? You practice it. Amen. Now, what I get from Lot as I look at his life a little bit here. There is something that I also see. I see that Lot, he really had a reprobate mind. Yep. Now, the word reprobate, we just simply means not able to judge right. properly. Amen? He wasn't able to. 
coupled with not having the word of God in his life, having spending time with the Lord. We know he didn't have the scriptures per se, but he did have the Lord. But he left the Lord way back. Amen. Right. So we see that Lot had a reprobate mind. Listen, the Bible says in, in uh, Romans 1 it says, and even as they did not like to retain in their knowledge, God or God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. You realize that Lot did some inconvenient things. Oh, yeah. He did some things that just weren't convenient. That word convenient just means it wasn't proper. It wasn't fit. It wasn't right. Listen, giving his two daughters to those men, that wasn't right. That's right. That was poor judgment. Yeah. Amen? Maybe you can think about some things in your life this morning that you say, man, that was just really poor judgment. Yeah. <laughs> wow, I, I, I don't even, I really shouldn't have done that. I did some things that are just not convenient, even today already. Some things that are not convenient. You know that the inoculation against tolerance is a renewed mind in the word of God. That's the inoculation. The Bible says in Romans 12, 2, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind. You realize that when I got saved, brother, when I got saved, and I don't know why I'm trying to associate this with you, but I'll just share my story with you is all. Uh, you know, when I got saved, I was a guy who wore his pants down here. <laughs> and I had <laughs> say it so and I had a big extra yeah slacker I had a three times two big shirt on t-shirt on and my hat whoop, to the side you realize that that was a mindset that I had isn't it something that when you see guys uh, or, you know, uh, 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 things of that nature like that, you realize that there is a mindset that goes with that. Oh, absolutely. Right. There's a mindset that goes with that. Listen, if I drive a if I drive a Tesla with all the bells and whistles on it, you realize that there's a mindset that goes with that, too. Right. You want to borrow it? <laughs> I got to buy it first, brother. They're like a hundred grand. They're, they're like a hundred grand. But the point that I'm trying to make here is that when my pants were down here and my shirts were three sizes too big and I had my hat cocked to the side and all of that, that there was a behavior and attitude that went with that. And you know what changed that? You know what caused me to put a belt on and put my pants up all the way up here and tuck my shirt in and do all that? You know, it was a renewed mind in the word of God. Amen. 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 That's exactly what it was. Uh, uh, listen, uh, it, it wasn't it wasn't the preacher saying, hey, you better get right. You better get the pants up. And you better, better. No, it was preaching and preaching and preaching and preaching and me sitting under the word of God with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit says, oh, you need to change that. Amen. And I said, OK. Right. right. Because when the Holy Spirit says it, he says it with power Amen. and conviction. Amen. Yeah. I said, yes, yes. <laughs> I say, yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. Amen. Because you know what I realized? I realized that that was just showing what? Immaturity? Oh, yeah. That I didn't know how to dress, right? That I needed a tailor, too, because apparently I don't know how to wear the right stuff, right? Police come shake me down. <laughs> yeah, I'm just inviting the, the police, right? <clears throat> Let me say this, that there is no middle ground. You're either going to be transformed or conformed. Amen. You understand? That there's no middle ground. So let's answer question number two. We're almost done. <laughs> and a poem. I don't have a poem. <laughs> so we see that why are some believers not sounding the trumpet and tolerance is, an, is the answer. Now, the second question when some Christians do sound the trumpet, why is it not a clear sound? Why is it not a clear sound? Now, testimony. That's the answer. Testimony. So we know the testimony of Lot. We know that it was not a good one. 
Uh, in fact, uh, when he tried to sound the trumpet and warning his family about the destruction of the two cities, uh, they did something that was very serious that you and I have to get a hold of. Go to Genesis chapter 19. Thank you for turning. Genesis chapter 19. And uh, we're on the downhill slope now. Uh, this point is not as long as the last one. Uh, I had to labor on tolerance because I believe that that is ever increasing in our society today. You know, I, I could have preached on Black Lives Matters. You know, this whole Kavanaugh issue, right? My, my brother Brian, he said, man, they go to Black Lives Matters all the time. Hey, listen. Listen, they need to get saved, brother. Amen. They need the Lord. Amen. Amen. But this whole Kavanaugh hearing, you guys, any of you guys been following that? You know, uh, the, the, the cry, the cries of, of oh, I don't even want to go there. Okay. <sighs> Never mind, because I'll just get, I'll take it to Facebook. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Genesis chapter 19. So, so something happened that we have to be careful that does not happen to us. And looking in verse number 14, Genesis chapter 19, verse 14. If you're there, say amen. Everybody there. All right. Verse number 14. It says, and Lot went out. Now, here we are. The angels have told Lot finally what they're going to do. And uh, uh, he didn't know these men at first. But now here they are. They're telling them, hey, we're going to destroy this city uh, because the cries of it has come up to God. And God says, you're going to have to pronounce judgment upon this place. And then he has told Lot about what is going to happen. <coughs> and Lot went out and spake to his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, up. Oh, with all seriousness, he says, up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But what happened? But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. Yeah. Hey, please don't let that be you. The one thing, dads and moms, that I want to have over my children is a godly influence. Amen. Amen? It's a godly influence. Amen. I want to be able to to I want my daughter, uh, our daughter, honey. I want her to take our walk with God seriously. Amen. Amen. But if your testimony is messed up, she's not going to see that you're serious about following the Lord. Amen. Yeah. Who are you to tell me? Uh, we deal with families all the time that are like that. That say, well, you know, my, my parents have been hypocritical in their walk with the Lord. They say one thing at church and then they go home and then they do a completely different thing. And I don't think that they're serious about walking with the Lord. But can I say that you need to be serious about your walk with God because it's going to potentially affect how you lead them That's right. in the future. When it comes time for you to tell your son or your daughter, hey, we need to get out of this place because God is going to destroy it. And they laugh at you. Don't you want to have influence over your kids like that? Isn't that important to you? That you have a godly influence. Yes, my daddy, he walks with God. My mommy, yes, she walks with God. That when things happen uh, in our family, they get on their knees and they pray. Amen. That listen, that, 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 that they love God. They're always going to church. They're always trying to do things for the Lord. No, it's not showing how spiritual I am, but it's just showing how much I love the Lord and want to be around him. And I want to be around his people. Christian. One question. How was your testimony? Young people, how was your testimony? You know, when, when you sound the trumpet to warn the people of the judgment to come, do they seem as one that is mocking to them? Do you seem like that? Listen, do they laugh at you and not take you serious? Are they laughing at you because they know how you live? Man, I see how you live every day. How are you going to try to tell me about the judgment to come? How are you going to try to tell me about Jesus? How are you going to try to tell me about Jesus? 
How are you going to try to tell me about Jesus? How are you going to try to tell me about Jesus? Arguing with your wife, cussing her out. How are you going to tell me about Jesus? Yeah. Hitting your wife, hitting your, beating your child like that. Well, you can beat your child, but you know. <laughs> How are you going to tell me about Jesus? Yeah. Amen. <laughs> yeah, I'm in. The, I'm sitting there and I'm yucking it up with the guys, and we're cussing, and they're they're dirty joking, and I'm laughing, and I'm adding to it. How are you going to tell me about Jesus? Yeah. Are they laughing at you because they see how you live? That was it for that point. Wow, that was a short point. But I think I, 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 I said what I needed to there. Now, in closing, I really am going to close. Because sometimes, right, Brother Smaltz, when a preacher says, and in closing, it's usually three or four closings, and then we're actually done, right? <laughs> I don't know how... how Preacher Smaltz does it. I'm sure he, he drives that car for a while, and then he looks for the garage to park, right? And so we're, we're going to park now, okay? Let's look at one more. <clears throat> so why is the believer not sounding the trumpet? Because of tolerance. Number two, when he does sound the trumpet, why is it not a clear sound? Because of his testimony. And then number three, let's talk about the trumpet. Amen. The trumpet. Go to first Corinthians chapter 14. Now, the trumpet that is being talked about over in Ezekiel chapter 33, it means shofar. Uh, shofar was a uh, was a uh, uh, I guess like a, it looks like a ram's horn or something. And uh, it's 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 kind of interesting how it looks. Uh, it's hard as as all get out to blow through. Uh, but but they use the shofar to uh, to announce certain things in the land. Yeah. OK, now. The definition of trumpet in that passage in Ezekiel 33, it means a clear sound, yeah. something that gives a clear sound. OK, now uh, let's look at first Corinthians chapter 14. And uh, we'll close. OK, want to just make a quick point here. First Corinthians 14, verse number six. And uh, the Apostle Paul is talking about charity and uh, talking about order and uh, how things ought to be done in love. And if they're done in love, they're going to be done in order. Amen. Done in order. And so he says here in verse number six of this passage, it says, Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you? Except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine. And even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction, underline that, a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? You know, they always say that you preach the loudest message by how? How you live, right? right? By how you live. Amen? Here we see that in verse number eight, for if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? Amen? I'm going to close by saying this. Your trumpet, when you sound it, is it a clear sound? Is it a clear sound? It's coupled with your testimony, isn't it? <clears throat> it's important about that trumpet. Man, that trumpet's so important, right? Our trumpet is herald heralding the gospel, amen? Letting people know. But if your testimony is not clear, if it obscures, if it's any of that, you realize that they're not going to know when it's time for the battle, right? That's right. Not going to do you any good. That's exactly, thank you, brother. For lack of better words, he said it right. It's not going to do you any good. That's right. Amen? No good. Uh, Lord gave me this thought a couple years ago back Thanksgiving. 
You know, my salvation is no good to me unless I give it away. That's right. You understand? Yeah. That the salvation that I have received from the Lord, I need to give it to somebody else. Now, of course, I can't save another person. No. That's solely the Holy Spirit of, of God's work. But my salvation, the salvation that God has, has given to me, I need to give it away to somebody else. I need to tell them how they can be saved. And you realize that it's more than just saying it, it's living it out. It's living it out. Are you living like you're saved? The Bible says that by their fruits, ye shall know them. Maybe you're not even saved in here and this message just bounced right off of you. You're just like, I don't even get what that guy's talking about. Some things to think about this morning. Think about your testimony. How is it? You know, I want to open up the, this time for an invitation. If you don't know the Lord as your personal Savior, and what I've just said is foreign to you, there is a judgment to come. That's right. You know, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, it is appointed unto man once to die. It says, but after this, the judgment. Listen, there's no reincarnation. There's no going into the ground, turning into ashes forever. There's none of that. There's after death, the judgment. Amen. The judgment. Okay. That means you're going to have to stand before a holy, just God. Amen. And you're going to have to give an account for your life. Yes. And he's going to open up the books. He's going to open them up. And he's going to say, okay, if you want to play that game, my good works outweigh my bad works. If you want to play that game, fine. Let's open up the books and see what you have done. I guarantee you, you're not going to win. That's right. But then there's another book. I like that book, The Lamb's Book of Life. Amen. Amen? <laughs> That's the book you want to be in. Amen? Amen? So where are you at today with this? I preached to you about tolerating. And no, I'm not talking about tolerating your husbands and your wives. I can't tolerate you no more. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about tolerating the sin and the wickedness That's in this right. world. Right. The very thing that God is going to bring judgment on. Yeah. Amen. Is there somebody here like that this morning? Seems like there's somebody here who needs to get saved. Is there somebody here where the Holy Spirit is just bringing conviction upon your heart right now this morning? And saying to you, you're not saved. That he's showing you your lifestyle. He's showing you who you are. And then he's pointing to the cross. That's right. Where Jesus Christ gave his life on Calvary for you. Amen. Where he shed his blood for your sins. If he's showing you that this morning, hey, don't delay. Get it right. Get that old account settled with the Lord today.